All right. So we are one T minus one week away from our exam. So you guys are aware of kind of where we're at in, in life here. <clears throat> Yesterday we left off, we were talking about kinetics and equilibrium. Um and how they relate. So just kind of a, a warm-up question. Then we talked about K versus Q. Remember, I like to refer to it as K versus Q instead of Q versus K. Because if you line it up as K first and then your Q, and you can do your greater than, draw, add a line to it, and it tells you which way the reaction is going to, to go for Le Chatelier. <clears throat> so that's the way I like to kind of approach this. All right. So are you able to find this question in that packet that I gave you? Calculate K for the following system if blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay, five. do that problem then. Go. Mm I think I'm going to assign you a pivot lab, too, for those of you who are taking the AP exam. I'm not going to grade it or anything, but I'm going to have you, I'm going to assign it on pivot so that you can go through it if you want, and then I'm going to send you the answers, too, to it. <clears throat> so you can go through as you're taking it. You can go through and check your work as you're going through it. Okay. Okay, add to the library. Hopefully this is stopped bleeding now. I broke a beaker in the back today trying to do lab prop and cut myself. <sighs> tell you. K doesn't have a unit, right? Correct. K is unit. K and Q are both unitless. Good. Were you able to get the value? Mm -hmm. I've got four seven. Oh, just a rounding thing. Yeah, that's fine. That's just a rounding thing. All right. Um, calculating K then. Um, remember, we can use the, the ice charts to be able to do that. Um, and here's an example. So see if you can do this example. We've got initially a mixture 0.1 molar NO, blah, 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 blah. So see if you can answer that question. Thank you. 
Okay, I added that out there and then I will email you. Oh, give it, wait, were, were we supposed to on the last one, like flip the equations around and use the previous equations to find? Because on here it's got, it lists like three reactions. see this problem on here. What problem is it? This one, this one's on your browser friend to the last one. Okay. All right. Like so the last one was 45, but um, this guy? Like the one right before it. Were you supposed to like flip the equations to find the third Yeah. Connection? Yeah. So we did that was one that we did on the video yesterday. I was just gonna, I was just gonna ask what I forgot like what when you use the k value like so right in the video if you watch the video and and I also uploaded this as Google Slides so you can go through it individually with these as well in case we run out of time or you guys are gone um, to an AP test next week and not able to do the review so if it's run in reverse then you in, do the inverse of k if um, you're multiplying by a constant, then you're going to raise the equilibrium to that power. And if you're adding reactions, you're going to multiply them together. Okay. Uh, all right. So, yeah. So when you run the reverse, the reaction in reverse, you just put inverse. The, the negative sign. To no, up. inverse. One over. Okay. One over is a positive value. Because you go down. Okay, did you get this? Did you get this one done? Oh, somebody's trying to Austin probably. Hello, sir. I'll turn my volume up so I can hear you. There we go. All right, so Austin, we're working on, we just finished this problem on here. Um, and we're getting ready to start a different one unless they have questions on this guy. You got questions on this guy? Okay. Um, remembering how to work your ice tables? Good. All right, so um, we can end up, and is this one on your sheet? Yes, this one's number 46 on your sheet that I gave you. So see if you can come up with a correct answer for this guy. And then Austin, I'm emailing you an answer key to a pivot lab. Um, you can go on and do that pivot lab and it's practice for FRQ questions. And then I'm, I'm going to email you the answer key. It's not an assignment. I'm not going to grade it, but it would certainly help you um, to get prepared for that material. Okay. Austin, Emily. Oh, not Emily, Emma. Good grief. Losing my mind. Emma C is not taking it. Eric. David. Why oh, I got you on there? No, she did. 
dropped it too. So that should be seven names. Three, who am I missing? No, I had seven names. Now I'm down to six. That's why. Okay. You guys ready for this one, the answer? No. Okay. I'm going to put it up there, and then when you're ready, you can look up, okay? Hey, Olivia, one sec. I got to go let my dogs outside. I'll be back. Downloads. And send. Okay, so there you go. I sent that out. Oh, I forgot to read announcements again. I can never remember to read announcements in. <sighs> I even had time to do it. I just forgot. It. Okay. Questions on this one? No? Good? Bad? Okay. All right. So magnitude of K, remember, if K is small, then that means that you're going to have reactants favored versus products. If they're about equal, if it's it's like in that intermediate range, then they're going to be a product. And then if K is large, that means that your products are going to be favored. And that's why when we were talking about like acid-base chemistry, when we end up with like a KW that is large, that means that it goes almost to completion. And that's what determines if we have a strong acid or a strong base. So very few of the reactants remain, and most of them are on the product side. We have strong acid, strong base. Typically, though, if we have weak acid, weak base, they're going to fall into this category. Um, Le Chatelier then, we've talked about that. If you add a reactant, it's going to shift to the products. If you add a product, it's going to shift back to the reactants. Remove a reactant, it's going to go. And we talked about this. And this was the hand signals where I'm like, okay, it's going this way. And you pull it away. And then you got to make more. And then, like, it's going to heat up. And so it's going to, so we talked about all of those. So, like, increasing the temperature, um, changing the pressure, changing the pressure. If you increase pressure, it's going to shift toward less moles of gas. If you decrease the pressure, it's going to shift to the more moles of gas. Um, adding an inert gas, this is one that they will get you on. Be very careful. So adding an inert gas doesn't have any effect on it. So because it's inert, it's not going to react with the stuff. So it's not going to change things. Um, increasing temperature then, endothermic shifts towards the products, exothermic. And just think of it, okay, if, if think of that as a reactant or as a product, okay? If it's endothermic, then it's going to get added. It'll be at, like another reactant sitting there. If it's exothermic, it's going to be like another product sitting there. Yeah. So an inert gas is one that doesn't share a common ion, right? It's just a gas that doesn't share a common ion. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's not going to, it's inert. It's not going to react with anything. So it could be any. It could be anything as long as it doesn't share the common ion. Or I guess. I guess. But my best way is like, what what is an example of inert gas? This is just many. Well, all of gas. your noble gases are inert. Okay. Um, because they typically don't undergo. It says here. An inert gas is a gas that does not undergo chemical reaction under a set of given conditions. The noble gases often do not react with many substances, and they were historically called inert gases because so, like when I was going through chemistry, typically it, it's used kind of interchangeably. The the noble gases and inert gases, that last column, they use that kind of interchangeably because typically they won't react with stuff because they have filled valence shells. 
so they have no need to react to become stable. Good? Okay. Um, again, we can use the shot VA, we can look at pH, temperature, solution color, absorbance, that sort of thing. All right, this is your next question, I believe. Yes, what is the maximum number of moles? Yep. You got a KSP value here. See if you can figure that guy out. An answer? All right, did you get D? I Good. All right, so we would um, set it up to X, then we would take the square root of this guy, and that would give us D. All right, see if you can calculate the KSP value for this guy. Or which, <clears throat> I'm sorry, which of the hydroxide salts would have the smallest KSP based on the solubility? Remember how to do these? It's because it's into a three to one ratio, right? Mm -hmm. So, so what's the what what is that? I'm just trying to think in my head. Isn't that like four? Is it four x cubed you got too? For here? No, it's seven. For these guys, they're going to be up. Yeah, they would be x cubed, but. But then it's 3x cubed times x, so it's 3x to the fourth, right? Yep. Because I, I have like it memorized. Like I know it's x squared, 4x cubed, and 3x to the fourth. Yeah. Good. Questions on this guy? All right, common ion effect, this comes up almost every year as well, um, where you're going to end up with common ions in, and that's going to change your solubility because you're adding more of this material in, which is then going to shift things. So um, it'll end up decreasing a lot of times that, um, that solubility because you've already got ions in there. So uh, quantity. Qualitative analysis then, um, remember that the lower the KSP, the less soluble substance is. So the qualitative analysis then also allows a ranking of salts for K by KSP and demonstrates the effect of pH on solubility. All right, acids and bases. Um, remember that as we move down here, as we add more electrons, at, this is going to become stronger because this the hold on this hydrogen becomes less. It's going to be easier for this hydrogen to be able to slip away here than it would be here. And so this is going to be a stronger acid down here. More of this is going to get rid of its hydrogen. And remember, acid ranking or, or how, how strong your acid is is based on how many of these hydrogens this material will give off. Because the pH is 
hearts hydrogen. That's what a pH stands for. Okay, so the more of these hydrogen ions that come off, the more parts of hydrogen you have. So is that why only H2SO4 is strong and not H2SO4? Right, so yeah, because the first one will come off easy, but the second one doesn't. And so the, the H2SO4, the first hydrogen is a strong acid, but the second hydrogen is, is a considered a weak acid because it's K, KW value would be lower than, or the Ka value would be lower. <coughs> the increased number of the oxygen atoms pulls this, the hydrogen, you know, the, the electron cloud density this way makes it easier for that hydrogen to come off. The greater the size of the negative ion, the weaker the attraction for the proton, and so the stronger the acid, the weaker the conjugate base, HI, is the strongest binary acid. So HF is actually considered a weak acid. Now that doesn't mean that it won't kill you, because it will, but it's considered a weak acid. Bronsted Lowry, this is the one that they want you to know for the exam. Remember we deal with hydrogen donator and hydrogen acceptor. So your hydrogen here is gonna leave and it's gonna come over here and join with this guy. And then on this side, that would be our conjugate base and over here, so does that make sense? And I always tell you guys to look at these pairs. So you've got this guy and this guy, look at your anions, okay? Which one has more hydrogen? That's your acid. Look at your anions. Which one has more hydrogen? That's your acid. All right, pH of weak or strong acids. Um, again, it's how many of those hydrogen ions are going to disassociate and come off of there. How many are, are sometimes they're called hydronium ions. Um, so this is a hydronium ion. Um, we either write it H3O plus or just H plus and just forget about the, the rest of the water on there. Okay. Um, so temperature here will affect our KW value. And that has to do with Le Chatelier's principle with, with um, it being endothermic, exothermic, that sort of thing. Okay, the disassociation of water is endothermic and an increase in energy will shift the reaction towards the right, increase in the forward reaction and increase the value of KW. Um, typically, most of the things that are given at for you um, on the AP exam will say 25 degrees or 298 Kelvin. Um, so they kind of keep that at that normal temperature state. Um, so just kind of be aware, though, that things can shift if your temperature shifts. Okay, ask yourself, is it strong, weak, a salt, a buffer? What will it do in water? And then um, deal with the strong acid base first. These react to completion with the available species. Let's see if you can figure out what this is going to be as far as an answer. Okay, so you're titrating a weak acid and a strong acid. So at the equivalence point, you would expect the pH to be greater than seven because this is a strong base. Okay, strong, weak acid, strong base. Yeah, I know. Um, remember that if it was a strong acid, weak base, then this would be true. If it was, if they were both strong and weak, or both strong, then this would be true. And then the pH equals the pKa at the half equivalence point. 
Well, this is at the equivalence point, so that would not be valid. That makes sense? Okay. So titrations, um, and you guys can go through, this has extra information on it. Um, and in that slideshow, if you want to go through and click these, if you want to go through and watch the videos that are associated with it, there's videos that are associated with these two. And this is all in the slide presentation that I uploaded to Google Classroom. Um, but these will give you different ideas of titrations. Again, um, you've got your Ka values with different acid um, molarities here. This is um, a two hydrogen situation where this would be like your H2S where you have an equivalence point for the first hydrogen and then an equivalence point for the second one. Okay. And then um, we can look at concentration with analytes here. So see if you can work towards that problem. Yeah. So if we're doing, if it asks for a drawing of like uh, a dichroic acid, then is the, the first one because it's, it's usually the strong is the biggest one yeah. and the second one is yep. the smaller. Mm -hmm. I'll be right back. How'd you do on that one? Did you check it yet? No? You guys are just quiet today, huh? How about D? How'd you do? I hope that's amazing. They do throw you some bones. They do. Because, you know, they're going to give you some simple ones there. So don't get, like, stumped by those either. You know, like, they will. Because they're trying to, like, differentiate the ones from the twos. Hopefully they're trying to differentiate you guys between threes, fours, and fives. But they do throw some bones out there to you for some of the easier ones. Okay? See how you do with this one.
doing there, Austin? Good. B, did you get B? Good, okay. Um, so we have, remember we get our titrations, we could have um, different strong acids, we have weak acids and strong bases. You have your polyproducts that have multiple locations. Um, and then they will titrate, they'll have you titrate like strong acid, strong base, weak acid, weak base, weak base, strong acid, but they're not going to have you do a week and a week. So you don't have to worry about that. <clears throat> yeah. Just so I don't get this mixed up on the test, but just if we were to draw one of those up again, what, um, how do you know like, which one you start with so you know which way you're drawing? Or, like, which one is, when it says titrated, which one is like being um, put to the other? So, you st whatever's in this flask is the pH that you're going to start with over here. But how do we know which one is in the flask, though? Like, how's it, how's it worded? Um, so they would say something like hydrochloric is being titrated with NaOH. So, so the titrant is what's in the burette. And that's what's being titrated into the, and I think they might call that analyte, but I don't know the technical term for it. So I don't think they use it that often. They'll just say like, I, um, NaOH is being titrated into hydrochloric acid. So the hydrochloric would be down here in this case, and the NaOH would be titrated into it. The titrant is what's in the urate. All right, see how you do on this guy. Do you have him on your sheet? This is number 50, I believe. Oh, no, no, it's not on your, okay. Based on the graph in question 50, which point would represent, yeah, that's the same one, the pH, which is dominated by the molarity of the hydrochloric. Based on the graph, yep. Which point would represent the region where the pH is dominated by the molarity of the hydrochloric acid being added? So it's being dominated, hydrochloric. Oops. I don't know if they, apparently they don't have the answer on there. Yeah, it would be E. I don't know why they don't show the answer on here, but you're supposed to be able to click this and have the answer show up. So yes, E. E would be the correct answer. That's where that hydrochloric will be dominated. We know that because that would have a low pH. All right. Um, oh, we had our buffers. They were so much fun, weren't they? pH of a buffer system is primarily determined by the pKa of the weak acid and the conjugate acid-base pair. When both species of the conjugate acid-base pair have equal concentrations, the pH of the buffer is equal to the pKa. Choose the conjugate base pair that has a pKa closest to the pH you desire. So look at that pKa and use that guy. Okay. So PK is the negative log of K, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, buffer is only effective as long as you have both acid and conjugate base pairs available. Once that happens, then you run out of the buffer and you've run out of your buffer capacity and then your pH will start to, to take off from there. So this is your buffered region here. So you're buffering, buffering, buffering. Oh, we ran out of it. Boom. Our pH goes way down, okay? Um, like the buffers are able to resist pH changes. These are very important when you're talking in terms of biological organisms. And, um, so they're going to take advantage of that. And this happens in your body all the time. You've got all kinds of buffer systems within your body that have to be maintained properly in order for your homeostasis to 
happen. So you, um, acid base um, buffering happens in your bloodstream. Okay, if you start breathing in too much, you know, if, if you have too much carbon dioxide or you have too little carbon dioxide, then your buffer system can run out and you can end up with acidosis in your blood system and end up with problems with that. So there's all kinds of buffering systems that happen within your body. Ah, thermochem, let's see if we can get through this today. I got 10 minutes to get through thermochem. Do you think I can make it? All right, entropy, embrace the chaos, okay? Remember delta S, we're increasing moles, increasing temperature, increasing volume, solid to liquid to gas, forming more complicated molecules. Water is gonna dissolve by forming the, um, by forming a shell of interacting water molecules. Um, and we tend to, when we have dissolution, we tend to increase entropy. And there's a few exceptions, but for the most part, that's gonna increase our entropy. Do not say like dissolves like. If you guys see like dissolves like, I will, and I get your test back and look at them in the fall and I see that, I'm gonna hunt you down, okay? Do not say that. Okay. Um, do not refer to LDFs, hydrogen bonding, and dipole-dipole. Uh, refer to these things. Do this, not that. Okay. And the reason why this stuff dissolves is because you've got these intermolecular forces that are acting upon this. Okay. So keep that in mind, please. I need to get down my knees and, and beg you not to mm -hmm. say this. Get that out of vernacular. I try not to even use that in class because I don't even want that in your head. Okay. Um, enthalpy here. Um, when we're talking about heat, if it goes down from the material, so if we give off heat, that's exothermic. And if you remember at the beginning of the year, I did a demo where I had um, alcohol and water and I brought it around and made you feel it. Okay. And it heated up. That was an exothermic reaction that was happening from that dissolution of these particles coming apart and coming back together here. It gave off heat. You can have situations where the opposite is true. Okay. Um, we like to use the term thermodynamically favored. Do not use spontaneous. They do not like that. Okay. Be careful with your entropy and enthalpy values because entropy is typically joules per Kelvin and entropy is in kilojoules, okay? And they will catch you on that if you are not very careful with your unit analysis. Yeah. Does it matter like which way you go? Like if you put it in kilojoules or joules? No, but typically like if they give you a delta G that's in kilojoules, this guy's in kilojoules, so it's just easier to change one versus the other, you know, versus changing two. Um, also, you need to read the question. So one of the common things on there that you'll see is the teachers will be like, read the question, and you can insert whatever word you want there, but you know what we're thinking, and answer the question, okay? Because... They'll ask you a question, and then people will go off on these long, spontaneous discussions of them. First of all, just get to the point, okay? They don't care how smart you are, okay? They want you to answer the question. So just answer. Plus, you don't have time. Like, you need to find time. Answer the flipping question, okay, and move on. But read it and make sure that it says answer in kilojoules. Answer the flipping thing in kilojoules. And make sure you put your units down. Because if you give them the right number and you don't have the units down, they mark it wrong. They don't care. They have no soul when it comes to stuff like that. Okay? So keep that in mind. But answer flipping question. Okay. Done. Don't the units come with most of the equations on the equation sheet as well? Yeah. But you need to write them down on your answer. And people don't do that because they're lazy. Okay, we talked about this rat link question. Do you remember that guy? Okay. 
Um, so keep him in mind. We talked about Faraday's constant. We did all kinds of calculations with him. Talked about delta G and K. We did calculations with those guys where we combined the rat link and we combine these two equations together. And you can solve for K then. If you're given this stuff, and then you can solve for K. Remember the natural log? To get out of that natural log, you do E to the X. Um, all right. Um, standard conditions here, Q equals 1. This is your rat link. Small change in delta G causes a sharp change in K. Um, and delta G becomes more positive. K becomes smaller. So this is a seesaw. Back and forth, back and forth. Um, forward reaction, then our K is going to get greater. Reverse reaction, K gets smaller. Delta G is the opposite. All right, see how you do on this guy. If you can calculate your cell potential. We did this guy, something similar to him a few days ago. No, you flip around equations here. When you flip the equation around, you flip the sign. Okay. The other thing with this is, is that these are intensive properties. So if you had to like multiply this guy by five, you're not multiplying this guy by five. And then you, uh, I forget, do you like add them together? You add them together? Yeah, uh, cation minus anion. Oh, that's right. Be sitting in the test going, ka, ka. So, I got a bunch more to go through. That's the right this, not that. So, try to spend some time this weekend going through the rest of these on that slideshow presentation so we can work on some FRQ questions next week, okay? Is it C? It is B. But this is all uploaded to Google Classroom for you, so you have access to this whole thing. So okay? how do we figure out which one's cation and um, Oxidation reduction. So your cation is going to have your higher value, and your anion is going to have your lower value. Right. I thought I, did, I must have did that before. Well, go home and look at it, and we can talk about it more next week if you're still confused. Are you going to be in class next week? Um, <laughs> Yes. Go look at the AP exam schedule and figure yeah, out if the, the three of you are going to be here or not. I'll be here. Okay. Austin, I'm heading out. Okay. See you, Lippy. Bye, hon. So, wouldn't the uh, Y be the cation? 